There's a story about a um, service in a Methodist chapel in uh, Yorkshire um, where the preacher was quite inexperienced and the sermon consisted of him pretty much saying the same thing over and over again but at excessive length. And after he'd been going for about half an hour, a comment was heard from the congregation. He's finished, but he hasn't stopped. <laughs> now, I'm slightly at risk of getting into that position today, but I hope we won't, because in the last four weeks, in our gospel readings, we have been working our way through chapter 6 of John's Gospel. And chapter 6 of John's Gospel is mostly about bread. And it's getting a bit difficult to find something new to say about it. Because um, the teachings in that chapter are quite repetitive, um, which is good because it drums, probably helps to drum it into us. But probably anything I could say about it has already been said. So, at risk of repeating myself, of risk, at risk of finishing before I've stopped, I thought it might be useful to do a bit of a recap of the whole chapter, pick out some of the main themes and cross-reference it with some other bits of the Bible. The chapter starts with the miracle that gets everybody talking and thinking about food in the first place. And it's John's version of one of the best-known stories in the New Testament, generally known as the feeding of the 5,000. Actually, it was many more because they only counted the men. Um, but this is a story that appears in all four of the Gospels. Besides this version of John, you can find it in Matthew chapter 14, Mark chapter 6, and Luke chapter 9. And it's pretty rare to find a story like this in all the Gospels. In fact, just about all the specific stories that appear in all four Gospels are part of what we call the Passion narrative. They're the events between Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and his death and resurrection. And you can understand why everyone's very keen to tell us about those because they are absolutely central, absolutely fundamental to any understanding of who Jesus is and what God has done out of love for his creation. But from Jesus' ministry before Palm Sunday, there is only one story that is deemed worthy of inclusion by all four gospel writers, and it is the feeding of the 5,000. So it must be pretty important. In John's gospel, uh, the significance of that story goes much deeper than uh, just the miracle itself because John doesn't ever include a miracle of Jesus just because it's a good story. John's gospel is structured around seven miracles of Jesus and each one says something specific about what G or who Jesus is. Um, and this is one of them, the feeding of the 5,000. And its significance is all to do with the bread. And, what, and it's sort of the hook on which the teaching in the rest of the chapter is, uh, it, um, is hung. And that teaching goes into quite a lot of detail, but its core point, it all revolves around uh, verse 35 which is when it says, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And that tells us that through Jesus, God is offering a much deeper, a much longer lasting nourishment than anything the world can offer. It's clear from Jesus' comments that he suspected that quite a large proportion of the crowd he was talking to were really only there for another free meal. But the food that he offers 
satisfies the deepings, deepest longings of our hearts, our longings for forgiveness, for meaning, for relationship, for love. It also becomes clear that you don't have to do anything to earn the food that God offers in Jesus. The religious culture that Jesus and the rest of the people he were talk, was talking to had grown up in laid a massive emphasis on keeping the law, which laid down in intricate detail what you had to do and what you had to not do in order to prove worthy of God's love. But Jesus taught that nobody can attain that level of worthiness by their own efforts. Instead, it is offered to us as a gift. And all we need to do in order to receive it is to accept it in faith and trust. Now, even for those people in the crowd who were actually thinking about it and engaging with Jesus' teaching, this was a really hard thing for them to get their heads around. It was really alien to everything they had been taught throughout their lives. And so they tried to understand it by reference to the best-known story about bread in the Hebrew Scriptures, which is the giving of manna to the Israelites in the wilderness. And if you don't know the story, you probably do, but you, if you don't know the story or want to revise it, re refresh your memory, uh, you can find it in Exodus chapter 16. And it tells us that the Israelites, on their way out of Egypt, had come into a desert where there was nothing to eat. And they compl complained at Moses and the other leaders, accusing them of having brought them all out in the, into the desert to starve. So God provided for them. He provided meat in the form of quails, little birds, in the evening, and bread in the morning. And the bread was a special sort that they'd never seen before. And it seems to have got the name manna because that sounds like the Hebrew for what is it? Which is what the story tells us they said when they saw it. The story of the miraculous provision of manna was a natural reference point for the people Jesus was by now arguing with. But he pointed out the obvious difference between that and the bread of life that God was now offering through him. The manna didn't last. In fact, the manna itself didn't last from day, one day to another. And the people who ate it were satisfied on the day, but it didn't sustain them forever, and eventually they died. Now, I think that to expect manna to have long-lasting effects would probably be to miss the point of it, um, because it was there to teach the Israelites to stop grumbling and to trust God's, God for his day-to-day -day provision. Even the fact that it went off if you tried to store it overnight was to teach them not to hoard what God had provided, but to trust that more would be given when it was needed. So to try to understand the bread of life brought by Jesus by reference to the manna story will only get you so far. And as so often, Jesus took the faith and tradition in which he had been brought up and he pushed it further in a way that it had never been pushed before. Because what was God was offering in the person of Jesus and what he offers to you and to me is a life that is more abundant than anyone had ever suspected before. And it's a life that lasts forever. And finally, in the part of the chapter that we heard read this morning, Jesus pushes the image of himself as the bread of life even further. He starts to talk about both his body and his blood as spiritual food and drink that bring lasting life. And in this, he's giving more than a hint about the way his life and ministry will pan out. For those of us who've read the rest of the story, it's relatively easy to see what he's talking about through the breaking of his body and the shedding of his blood on the cross, the way was made for all of us to receive God's love and forgiveness and the bread of life. 
Jesus' words here about eating his flesh and drinking his blood were echoed by his teaching at the meal we now know as the Last Supper. And it's largely from these two episodes that we get the central Christian practice of Holy Communion, where we share together bread as a symbol of his body and wine as a symbol of his blood. Unfortunately, the basic human tendency to take precious things and mess them up has led over the centuries to this precious celebration of God's grace and love, becoming a source of division and exclusion. For those who wanted to control and exploit their fellow human beings, it was easy to take Jesus' words, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you, and twist them so that participating in communion, not faith in Jesus, was the basis of salvation, the key thing that you had to do. And once you'd done that, you could then exclude from communion anyone who didn't toe the line, or you could refuse to share in communion with other Christians with whom we didn't agree. And we still live with that, in the scars of that in the world today. But I think, and I thank God, that we are gradually moving away from those divisions. We are learning to value and appreciate our fellow Christians in all our diversity. We are learning that communion, as a symbol of Jesus, the bread of life, is a gift from God, which is ours not to control, but to receive and share with humility and, love and joy. This time next Sunday, Rachel and I will be sharing communion in a very different style from what we are used to here at St. John's because we will be with several thousand other people at the Greenbelt Festival. Those people will be of all ages, of different races and nationalities, different genders and sexualities, a vast range of traditions and life experiences and ideas about God. And we will all gather around bread and wine, symbols of Jesus, the bread of life. And we will celebrate together our diversity and our unity. And it will be wonderful. It always is. Jesus, the bread of life, is a gift that we can all share, all receive, all enjoy, all the time. It doesn't actually require the explicit sharing of bread and wine. It isn't dependent on our following specific forms of words. It isn't even dependent on our meeting together for worship. All of those things are good and valuable, of course, but the power of the Holy Spirit, the grace of God, and the love of Jesus are constantly active in the world. And they are active whether we engage or not, whether we understand or not, whether we participate or not. But if we choose to engage, choose to participate, choose to try to understand, the gift of God in Jesus is bread that fills, that satisfies, that gives lasting hope and belonging and joy. And that gift is available to everyone to receive, to savour and to share. <laughs>